right, so tonight, on this Christmas Eve, we're going to be looking at the birth of Christ, what it looked like in the past, what it means to us as believers, as Christians, born-again Christians, presently, and what the birth of Christ means for believers in the future. And thus, I've titled today's message, Christmas, yesterday today, and forever. And we're going to be going through several passages this morning, so um, I'll be sharing those with you, and it's going to be up to you whether you want to go there in your Bibles or if you just want to read along. Um, But I'm going to be having three main passages. Um, Again, what it looked like in the past, what it means to Christians presently, and what it means for believers in the future. So our first passage is going to be the story of basically Christmas, um, as seen, as told by Matthew, and so we'll be in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to be reading from verse 18 all the way to 24, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 24, and there the Word of God says, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way, after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before They came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become, a, will become pregnant, and will give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the, Lord, the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her. But he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. And he named him Jesus. Now, in this passage we just read, we're given the account of what Joseph experienced when he first heard about what was going to be happening um, to him and his family and the announcement of his coming son. Now, his birth, Jesus' birth, was definitely most, it's, it was definitely extraordinary. Now, for a minute, I just want to talk about Jesus' birth and his life. In regards to his birth, there's, again, extraordinary events that took place before, during, and after. We just read the account of what happened before he was actually born. How an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and also appeared to Mary um, in one of the other um, accounts and told them what was going to be happening. Now, for here, Joseph, I mean, it was, again, it must have been just mind-blowing, mind-blowing for him finding out that his soon-to-be wife, his bride-to-be, was going to be having uh, a child. And, you know, back then that was a big taboo, I mean, for a woman to be pregnant before she was about to get married. I'm sure it is, but not today, but not as much as it was at that time. And all of it, again, had to do with the culture and the the place and the time that they were living in. But um, Joseph was definitely struggling with this idea. And you can tell that he had already made up his mind what he was going to do. Um, He was going to divorce her secretly. And just let her be, and you know he was going to make a scandal about it. But God had other plans, and He had an angel visit him and to tell him what was going to be happening, and and that he wasn't to divorce her. He was supposed to stay with her. The child was going to need a father, a earth, an earthly father. And I definitely believe this speaks today as well. Children, boys, girls need their fathers around. They need their dads. They're a big 
important, instrumental part of their lives. Now, fathers, you have an important role. You've got to be there for your children. You know, the Bible tells us not to, you know, we've got to discipline them, yes, but not to, you know, we're not to be harsh with them. Not to, you know, you just have to be fair, good, be honorable, be examples to them. But children also, you have to honor your parents as well. Regardless of how you feel, what stage in your life you're in, but honor your parents as well, honor your father. But again, he, Joseph here had a responsibility and he took it head on. Um, there are other stories that we can get into in regards to what happened prior to his birth, but man, he got even crazier during his birth. You know, we have, you know, the... You know, stories of the angels and the shepherds and the wise men and, you know, the, how they got to Bethlehem and, you know, the fact that they couldn't find an inn and there Jesus was in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. And again, extraordinary. You know, you would think that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would choose to be born in a mansion or in a castle and, you know, with all kinds of comfort around him and and warmth and all that, but no. He was born in a manger. Humble. So we can relate to him. So he can, you know, show us what real, real humbleness is. So again, a lot of extraordinary events happening during. And again, I can get into it, but I would be going on way too long. And then afterwards, one of the biggest things I can think of is that comes to mind is they were hunted down. Jesus was hunted down by Herod. Imagine being Joseph. Man, you're thinking, I, we just had this baby, now we've got to go on the run. And he took his wife and his child and took off. He was protecting his family. He was looking out for the interests of his family. So he left, and, you know, things didn't get easier. Things didn't get easier at all. Even so, even with the birth of the Savior, with the birth of Christ, glorious, the angels, everything, there were still issues that had to be dealt with. It didn't mean all the problems that were going to be gone for Joseph and Mary. They were only beginning. And this shows us again as Christians, once we're born again, it doesn't mean that all our problems are going to go away. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be all fine and dandy. There's still going to be issues. There's still going to be problems. There's still going to be people we're going to have to run from. There's still going to be battles that are going to have to be fought. But the entire way, we know that Christ will be with us, that God the Father will be with us. The Holy Spirit will be in us, guiding us, showing you, instructing you. You have to trust him. You have to trust God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Just as Joseph did, just as Mary did. He's there. He will always be there. And that, again, he had an extraordinary uh, birth. And, and he also had an extraordinary life. Now, two things, I, I, again, I can talk about his life, all the things that happened throughout his life, but there was two things that distinguished his life from the life of others. First of all, his words. In John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything, everything I have said. Everything he said, all his words were from the Father. God commanded him. I mean, if you think about it, even things that you probably didn't think were coming from the Lord, you know, were coming from the Father, were coming from the Father. He was just obeying the Father, showing us again the importance of obeying God the Father, the importance of obedience. Now, the other thing that distinguished his life from, those, from that of others is his works. 
Before he was born, God told Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18, on that day, the deaf will hear the words of a document. And out of a deep darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. And this was also somewhat repeated in Isaiah chapter 32, verse 3. So now listen to what Jesus told John's disciples when he sent them. He was having doubts. He was in prison. He was having doubts about if Jesus was who we really said, who we really believed he was. And so he told John's disciples in Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. His words and his works distinguished him, distinguished his life from the life of others. Now also, I want to touch on his resurrection, I'm sorry, his rejection and his death. Now, I know this isn't an Easter service. This is a Christmas service. We're celebrating his birth, but all this is connected. His birth was necessary with just one step in the process. But regarding his rejection, again, that little baby child will one day grow up and be rejected. Rejected by man. Will feel that hurt of rejection all of us have felt it maybe one in one way or another but that baby in that manger would grow up to be rejected we're told in john chapter 1 verses 10 through 11 he was in the world and the world was created through him and yet the world did not recognize him he came to his own and his own people did not receive him now this was foretold or prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. And there God said, or it says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. So yes, he was rejected by men, by his own people. Even his family thought he was losing it. They, they wanted to stop him. They, they thought, they were like, no. You know, he experienced a lot of the things we experience. And he knows what it's like to be rejected. Now, regarding Jesus' death and why it was just as important as his birth... Let me tell you this. First of all, his death was substitution and redemption. Let me explain. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So by dying on a Roman cross, Christ died a substitute. Christ died as a substitute. For all of humanity. Christ's death also provided redemption. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 20 states that believers have been bought with a price. Bought is the Greek word uh, agarazo. Which pictures a slave being purchased in the ancient public slave market. So in other words... Christ purchased believers out of the slave market of sin and set them free. His death was also propitiation, propitiation and reconciliation. The death of Christ provided propitiation, meaning that the righteous demands of a holy God were fully satisfied. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 explains that God displayed Christ publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith, through faith. Christ provided a satisfactory payment 
for sin through his death, God was satisfied. His holiness was upheld and his divine wrath was averted. A further result of Christ's death is that man is now reconciled to God, meaning that the man, meaning that man who was estranged and alienated from God is now at peace with him. The enmity and hostility have been removed. Through his rebellion in, his gar in the garden, man moved out of fellowship with God and needed to return to fellowship. Reconciliation is God providing peace where previously there was enmity and God restoring man to fellowship with himself. His death also provided forgiveness and justification. Christ's death resulted in forgiveness for sinners. God could not forgive without proper payment. Christ's death provided the, the legal means whereby God could forgive sin. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 declares that God has forgiven us all, all our transgressions. The word forgiveness comes again from the root word for grace. Thus, forgiveness means to forgive out of grace. And again, a further result of Christ's death is justification for the believing sinner. Justification is also a legal act in which God the judge declares the believing sinner righteous. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 explains, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So to put it in another perspective, imagine you've been given a coin called justified. Well, on one side of that coin represents the removal of your sin. However, on the other side of that coin, it represents the bestowal of Christ's righteousness upon the believer. Now, I, I won't get into it. I, again, it'll probably take me a bit, but, you know, his death also gave us resurrection. Well, the re we talk about the resurrection and his ascension. But again, he appeared to 500 people after his death, after he was risen, after three days on dead, he rose from the grave and he hung out 40 days and was seen by 500 people. And then he was taken up to heaven. And right now he sits at the right hand of God. So again, his, his, his birth, his life, and his death, extraordinary. Absolutely beautiful, wonderful. It's exciting every time I read about it, every time I hear about it. You know, every time I imagine what the situation would have been like, it completely blows my mind away. But again, he lived. That little baby was going to experience so much. Everything from love to physical pain, emotional pain, and eventual spiritual separation from God the Father. All for us. All for us who were sinners. So again, what does this all mean for believers? Romans chapter 8 verse 11 tells us, it tells us there that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also raise, will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit that lives in you. So now, if you're born again, if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit living. You have God's spirit living in you, the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and who will one day raise us all up as well. The same spirit that is guiding us, teaching us, molding us, shaping us into the image of Christ. That's why it's so important that we listen carefully. We listen carefully to what the spirit has to say. So again, 
that first part, Christmas past, his life, his death, his, li- his birth, his life, his death. So now the next part I want to read is what his birth means for us as believers today. And for that, I'm going to be reading out of the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, I'm going to be reading verses 10 through 13. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Now I want to point out a particular part of this passage that tells us why Jesus' birth is so important. The part where it says, but to all who did receive him, he gave them. What have believers been given? The right to become children of God by being spiritually reborn of God. This rebirth also is referred to as regeneration. Now, for those who may be uh, still a little confused, let me just briefly explain. In the spiritual birth, the Holy Spirit is the means of regeneration. In other words, he is the one who regenerates. When Jesus said in John chapter 5, um, chap- verse chap- John chapter 3, verse 5, unless someone is born... The phrase he uses is passive, which indicates that it's a work done upon man, not by man. So you see, man does not bring about regeneration. The Holy Spirit produces it. And this happens instantaneously. The moment a person truly surrenders their life to Jesus and truly accepts him as their Lord and Savior. And so you see, unless one is born again, as Jesus said in chapter 3, verse 3, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Simply put, you don't have to work your way into heaven because all the work has been done for you. God the Father sent his son for you. God the Son died on the cross for you. And God the Holy Spirit does the regeneration for you. All you have to do is receive the incredible gift God wants to give you. His son, Jesus Christ. Here's John. In, here's John chapter 1, verse 12 again, but in the New Living Translation. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Have you believed in him? Have you accepted him? If you are, then you're a child of God. If you're not, you're going to have an opportunity at the end of this message to be one. That's not all. Something else happens when you're born again and become a child of God. Let me read to you what Paul put in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Thus, because of that child, because of that baby that was laying in that manger 2,000 years ago, a born-again believer will have a new nature and a new life. Now, here's what I mean by a new nature. According to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, when the Holy Spirit regenerates someone, a new divine nature is placed upon them. He or she is essentially, essentially receives a new self and that is now capable of truly living a righteous life that seeks to glorify God. The new believer will also have a new life. Now, this doesn't mean 
that they won't have to face the consequences for the bad choices that they made. The bank, robber, the bank robbery someone committed yesterday won't disappear just because they became a born-again believer today. The new life means that they will receive a new mind so that they may know God, a new heart so that they may love God, and a new will that they may obey God. In other words, their life will no longer be defined by anything other than who they are now in Christ. So before moving on to the last part of of this message, let me quickly sum up what I've been saying here. The birth of Jesus over 2,000 years ago was the greatest gift mankind didn't deserve. That child wrapped in swaddling cloths was God's son, the savior of the world, and humanity's only hope for reconciliation. But you see, a gift is only a gift if it's freely received by who it's given to. Today, that gift of salvation and reconciliation is still available to anyone who will accept the Son and believes in Him. And those who do, those who have, have or will have the right to become children of God because they will be spiritually born by the Spirit of God. And the result of this will be a new nature and a new life within the born-again believer. And so now that we've covered Christmas in the past, what it means for believers today, I want to end by explaining what the birth of Christ means for believers in the future. And I want to do that by reading to you a famous verse that I'm sure all of you have memorized or know, like the back of your hand, and it's again in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. It's that famous verse in verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. I know it too, but I like to read it. I like to read my Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The birth of Jesus gives the believer the security of eternal salvation. This eternal security, therefore, doesn't rest with anything or anyone or anything anyone can do or will do, but with God. And is based on the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, let me briefly explain. Here's how the Holy Spirit, how salvation is based on the securing work of the Father. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 tells us that believers are secure because God the Father has chosen them to salvation from eternity past. In the verse after that, it says that the Father predestined believers to come to the status of sonship in Christ. Paul also wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30, that the Father has the power to keep believers secure in their salvation. You see, the ones the Father foreknew, predestined, called, and justified are the same ones he brings to glorification in the future. None are lost in the process. The Father's love for believers also guarantees their security. Here's now how it's based on the securing work of the Son. The Son has redeemed the believer, removed the wrath of God from the believer, justified the believer, provided forgiveness, and sanctified 
the believer. Moreover, Christ prays for believers to be with him. He continues to be their advocate at God's bar of justice. And he continues to make intercession for you and for me as the believers, as our high priest. If a believer could be lost, it would imply Christ is ineffective in his work as the believer's mediator. In addition, Jesus has promised his followers life everlasting. In John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, he said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one, let me repeat that, no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Note what Jesus Prom- Note, again, that Jesus promised eternal life. He promised it. If a believer could lose their salvation, it wouldn't be eternal. Further, Jesus says that they will never perish. Never, never is a double negative in the Greek, which would translate not never to reinfer- reinforce the point. Additionally, the word stands in the prophetic, emphatic position of the text, emphasizing the follower of Christ will not never perish. As a believer, as a Christian, you will not never perish. Amen. It's beautiful. Believers are in Christ's hands. And in the Father's hands. And no one can snatch us out of their hands. For believers to lose their salvation would require someone or a force greater than Christ and stronger than the Father. And I don't know anybody or anything, any God who is greater than God the Father. I don't know any prophet who who is a savior. I don't know any person in this entire world that was born the way Jesus was born over 2,000 years ago. He is our savior. God the Son is our savior and God the Father is our Father. And no one will ever take us away from them. So it should be abundantly clear that the salvation of a born-again believer is 100% secure. Finally, a believer's eternal salvation is based on the securing work of the Holy Spirit. As I already mentioned, the Holy Spirit has regenerated the believer, giving them life. Well, according to John chapter 14, verse 17, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer forever. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says that he has seated the believer. He has sealed the believer for the day of redemption, which then becomes a down payment guaranteeing our future redemption, our, our future inheritance, I'm sorry. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 The believer is baptized into union with Christ and into the body of believers. And so again, for a believer to lose his or her salvation would damage a reversal, would demand a reversal and an undoing of all the preceding works of Father, Son, and Spirit. When it comes to a born-again believer's security, The concerns, usually uh, the issues or debates revolving, is usually revolves around who does the saving. Those are, that's the main debate. But here's the thing. If man is responsible for securing his salvation, then he can be lost. If God secures a person's salvation, 
that the person is forever secure. So to put it simply, eternal security of a believer, it's security, the eternal security of the believer by the grace of God is the completion and the crowning glory of God's plan of salvation. I think I may have time to share one more verse with you. And it's from Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles. And there it says, God want, wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, we know that the Holy Spirit's presence in our hearts guarantees our ultimate salvation. Even though we're in this world, we're not of it. And God will continue to work in us until he has finished perfecting us. This forward-looking guarantee of perfection is what is meant by Christ in you, the hope of glory. The J.B. Phillips translation of Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 puts it this way. The secret is simply this. Christ is in you. Yes, Christ in you, bringing with him the hope of all glorious things to come. The hope of glory is the fulfillment of God's promise to restore us and all creation. This hope is not a wishful thought, but the confident, expectant, joyful knowledge that we are being changed by God and will one day see Christ face to face, having been conformed to his image. This hope and glory includes our resurrection. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, if the spirit who raised him from, who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the spirit who lives in you, through his spirit who lives in you. Which 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 also includes a heavenly inheritance. He writes there, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead and an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Therefore, the birth of Christ and his presence in us is the hope of glory. And this truth is full of glorious riches. Our once dead darkened spirits are made alive. He is our hearts, and we know that there is life beyond this earthly existence, a life that will be glorious beyond all our imaginations. God has given us life through his son, through that child, Jesus Christ. And because of him, we are free and available, and that gift is free and available to anyone who asks for it. However, before we can accept it, God desires two things from us. And this is where I'll be ending here. First, God wants us to trust in his son and savior, as savior and Lord. We come to know Jesus through repenting of our sins and accepting him as our, Lord and sa as our personal Lord and savior. God wants you to know him. And we, you can only know him through Jesus. And secondly, God wants us to be conformed into the image of his son. The father wants all of his children to be like Jesus. He brings situations into our lives to refine us and chip away those flawed characteristics that keep us from become, becoming who he designed us to be. As Jesus was obedient to the father in everything, and that should be the goal of every child of God, to obey the heaven, our Heavenly Father. So on this Christmas Eve service, I need to ask this important question. Have you offered to God what he desires most from you? 
If not, will you? Anyone is watching and listening to this message right now and you see your need for Jesus. You see your need to be saved, to be born again, to have, to be reconciled to God. If this entire year you walked away from the Lord and now you want to be brought back to him, he will accept you, he will love you, he will not reject you. He still has you in the palm of his hands. But for many of you, you're not there yet, and he wants to put you there. Will you believe in him? Will you trust him? Will you make him your Lord and Savior? If so, all you have to do is come to the cross, lay your sins there, and he'll take them. And will forgive you all your past presents, all your past, present, and future sins, and make you holy. All those things you did, those horrible sins, all those they're all will be placed upon Jesus and you can now come to the Father innocent all because of what Jesus did on the cross. And so if you're ready to be forgiven of your sins and you want to begin Christmas morning as a new born again believer, as a new born again Christian, I want to lead you in a prayer. But don't hold off. So many loved ones, so many people probably you know and care about have passed away this year because in many different reasons, but mostly because of this horrible COVID illness and the new unicorn one. I, I, I don't know, but, <laughs> you know, you can know for sure tonight that starting tomorrow, you will be, if you were to breathe your last, you will be face to face with the Lord. He will love you and accept you and welcome you into his kingdom. So again, if you're ready to give him your heart, your life, and make him and be born again, pray this. Close your eyes and bow your head and pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I turn from my sins and, and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior, Savior. I thank you for saving me. So now I ask you that you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, teach me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, please reach out to us. We want to hear from you. We want to maybe lead you in your next steps of your Christian walk. We want to maybe, if you're out of state somewhere else, we want to maybe help you find a church, a good Bible-teaching church where you can go to, and again, if you're here in the area, we want to invite you this Sunday. We will have services upcoming in a couple of days here at church, so we're in the corner of Hondo Pass and uh, Gateway South, uh, and yeah, we'll be having service. You'll be taught the Word of God, so um, please reach out to us. We want to hear your story. You don't have to go through this Christian walk. You shouldn't go through this Christian, Christian walk by yourself. This will conclude our mes uh, message for those watching online. Um, we hope that, again, we'll, next time we'll see you will be on Sunday. But until then, have a merry, merry Christmas. May be blessed. May, you, may God's blessings just rain upon you. May you just remember what Christ did. Everything that was mentioned here in this, in this message. And may you be reminded every day that you are a child of God, that you, he is in you and he is with you and he will never let you go. See you on Sunday. Have a great time. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. 
If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.